Thanks so much, Indira. Thank you so very much, Indira. I, I'm, I'm here to talk to you today about what makes China tech tick. Technology has very much moved to the center of the tensions now between the US and, and China. Uh, these are you know, tensions that have unsurprisingly been a major topic of discussion, not only here at the Camden Conference, but at just about every other China-focused conference that I've been to uh, in the last year or so. Uh, the controversy over Chinese technology is not limited to the really conspicuous things like the big companies like Huawei, which I think probably not a single speaker here has failed to mention because it's so very much in the news, uh, but it's just about everything bedeviling US-China relations. It boils down to technology or it has a very large component of technology to it. Uh, our bilateral trade issues, I'm sorry to inform you, are not really about soybeans or pork or steel or aluminum over capacity or anything really like that. I think they're at bottom very much about, uh, about technology. It's not the goo and the tchotchkes on the shelves at Walmart. And I, it's very much about technology. If you look at the 301 complaint, the 301 report, which is really the basis for the current trade war right now, uh, you look at, at well, it's the truce. Uh, it, it, we're in a truce period, thankfully. Um, but it's about China's industrial policy. It's about this Made in China 2025 uh, program, which the US claims will unfairly advantage Chinese technology companies in competition for the, the very technologies that will define manufacturing uh, in the coming decades, that will define the industrial might of nations in the coming decades. It's about uh, forced technology transfer. It's about things like uh, industrial espionage, about which you've heard an awful lot from earlier speakers already. And, and it's about more, much more than I just, just trade uh, or, or American competitiveness. There's a very strong values dimension to it. What do I mean by that? I mean, it, it's about concerns and anxieties that we have about the uses to which the Chinese government intends to put these technologies. Uh, you will have noticed, if you do follow the news, a very appreciable uptick in stories about things like uh, the use of facial recognition technology, and not just for the relatively innocuous purposes of, say, catching th criminals or thieves, but, of course, catching political criminals or thought crime prim criminals. Uh, you will notice that it's the most sinister use, of course, is that it's now used in public toilets to prevent you from taking too much toilet paper. <laughs> uh, but. No, I, 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 I kid you not. It's, it's true. We routinely, though, no, I think, I mean, probably we're most worried about the use of that and, and uh, not just facial recognition technologies, but also uh, DNA sampling to, uh, in, in very, you know, nakedly repressive efforts in uh, Xinjiang province or in Xinjiang Autonomous Region uh, with the Uyghurs, which has been very much in the news. And now we're routinely reading pundits who, who say that Xinjiang is just merely a sort of testing ground for these technologies that will then be eventually rolled out to control the, in an or, or, or darkly Orwellian fashion the rest of the Chinese population. Uh, in the last year especially, we've seen a great many stories about China's so-called social credit system. I'm um, sorry to report that there, a lot of the reporting uh, on this has been woefully inaccurate. Uh, they tended to conflate, for example, private initiatives by companies like Tencent or by Alibaba, uh, which, to be honest, more resemble sort of loyalty programs from Starbucks than they do uh, actual you know, Orwellian systems of, of social control. Uh, they've conflated these, unfortunately, uh, with the few pilot programs that have rolled out, uh, and many of which have already, in, in a short time, been canceled, we should maybe also look inward and see how very intrusive our own credit scoring systems are. I mean, I'm obsessively checking my credit score, but I don't know about the rest of you, but um, th there, there are, of course, also stories about, uh, you know, foul play on the part of the Chinese in technological competition. Some of them are quite well grounded, seem very well sourced. For example, the Marriott Hotels hack, where some 500 million names and, and, and private information on Marriott customers seem to have been compromised. Others, less well so. There was a, a Bloomberg story, which I'm sure many of you saw, uh, which was about the sinister Chinese having managed to plant a rice grain sized chip on motherboards that went into thousands and thousands of, of servers in Amazon and in Apple uh, internet data centers, which I think has been 
almost thoroughly discredited now. But we often read about China's rising technical, technological prowess in other areas that are maybe more concerning in artificial intelligence, in advanced robotics, in quantum computing. You've heard a lot of this stuff uh, just in the last, last day. Even in some consumer technologies and beyond the sort of civilian tech, much of which George Yip talked about in his very excellent talk, uh, if you pay attention to what's being written about in China's military technology, you'll, you'll read about uh, rail guns, ship-mounted rail guns that are really, really ad uh, quite advanced in China right now, uh, about hypersonic missile technology, about carrier killer missiles and the like. A uh, concern then over, over China's growing capabilities and technology uh, is, is very real. It also darkly, it lurks behind uh, our concerns now about the number of Chinese STEM, science, technology, engineering, math students who are um, in Chinese or in, in American universities. And that I find to be very deeply disturbing. Uh, there have been now moves in the House and in the Senate to try to restrict those numbers uh, the visas that are going to be given to Chinese graduate students and other researchers, which I think is a square shot into the middle of our own foot. Uh, but, but think about this here. Um, here in, in the US, our narratives about Chinese technology have really shifted. I don't mean just shifted. Uh, they have swung wildly. They have flipped completely over. Uh, and this has happened very abruptly, very recently, uh, and so abruptly that I think we ought to see a flag. I mean, that really raises flags about uh, what we're thinking now and what we were thinking then. Uh, let's talk about what some of those narratives are and how they've flipped. So not so very long ago, there was sort of a consensus uh, that the internet, the advent of the internet, and especially the advent some years later of social media in China was going to be a, a tremendous force for liberation. It was going to expand the public sphere. It was going to, in the famous words of, of Bill Clinton, right? Uh, he said, you can't nail the jello to the wall. Uh, we used to talk about that all the time. Um, it was part of the same kind of over-optimistic over belief held by some, I certainly would not say most people, who uh, were proponents of engagement, people who maybe naively believed that uh, engagement would produce uh, immediate and lasting political change. Uh, the internet seemed like the ultimate tool for engagement. That was a, a techno-optimism, what I, I call maybe liberation technology is a pl play on liberation theology. Uh, and, and this idea endured well into the Arab Spring, uh, you'll remember. I mean, before that, too, in, in the late color revolutions, like Moldova, which we handily, well, we tend to handily append the name of some American social media product to every single one of these uprisings. So Moldova was the first of numerous so-called Twitter revolutions. In 2009, when Ahmadinejad won re-election in Tehran, the northern suburbs of Tehran exploded in what some called the Green Revolution, but then quickly became called what? The YouTube Revolution. Then Tahrir Square in Egypt during the Arab Spring was the Facebook Revolution, of course. China, by the way, was taking notes and going, oh, Facebook, how do you have FAC? Got it, blocked, right. <laughs> In China, things didn't turn out the way that the techno-optimists had expected, of course. And if you look at the present understanding of the relationship in China between advancing technology and levels of political liberty, it's clear that the prevailing belief today among Americans and other Westerners is that technology enables repression. In fact, we're so worried about the illiberal potential of China's technology that the, we're all concerned about its spread beyond China's borders, that China is somehow exporting these technologies of repression and enhancing the abilities of other authoritarian states to control their populations. There's another way, another, a second way in which the technology narrative has really flipped when it comes to China. I, I reported on the tech sector back, and this, this harkens very much to what George Yip was talking about, from imitation to innovation. I reported on the tech sector in China for many years, um, of my time of China, from 1999 to roughly 2000, oh, really, I was in and around technology all the way up until 2016, but reporting on it up through 2007. Uh, for most of that time, People who claimed that Chinese technologies were actually innovated, were, were innovative, were, were, were very much in the minority. You know, there was the joke back then. We said the C to C business model, which stands for you know consumer to consumer here, stood in China for copy to China. 
right? That's, that's what we call, look, C2C, another C2C company. And indeed, it's true, as George pointed out, that there were uh, clones of US inter internet companies that simply abounded. Everything was the this and that of China. Uh, this idea of Chinese internet companies being mostly incapable of innovation really endured until just a couple of years ago. If you'll remember, in the spring of 2015, our then Vice President Joe Biden was going around giving graduation speeches at a number of universities in which his main theme was how, because we are an innovative, we are a country where information flows freely, where academic inquiry is unrestricted, we will forever maintain an innovative edge over China. Uh, Carly Fiorina, uh, that year and the, the following year, after she announced her nomination for the presidency, made it a major feature of her speeches to talk about how uh, China was incapable of innovation because it's not free. She would, in fact, challenge people in the audience, show me one thing that China has innovated. I guess nobody in the audience had WeChat loaded on their phone, or they would have. <laughs> that's kind of funny. but. Uh, now, now, suddenly the worry, weirdly, is that those innovative Chinese tech companies, you know, that are now apparently proliferating in China, are going to eat our lunch. Americans are suddenly concerned that the Chinese are out innovating us in key areas of technology. Think about this, though. In no time, we'd gone from this open contempt of China's innovative capacity, coupled, I might add, with this completely unfounded hubris, this idea that not only was our freedom a necessary condition, but also a sufficient condition for us to maintain uh, innovative edge on, on, on all the other uh, authoritarian countries. Um, it was an exact, now we have an exaggerated regard for China's ability to innovate. And I, I mean no, no slight at, at George here, but I, I'm not sure that doesn't contribute to, to this hyperventilation that we're now collectively experiencing about this unstoppable Chinese tech juggernaut that's gonna roll over all of us. For my part, I would have welcomed a sensible correction to the old understated beliefs in China's ability to innovate, but I am very alarmed uh, at, at this collective freakout we are now experiencing. Uh, we are as wrong in our overestimations today as we were in our underestimations a few years ago. I honestly believe that. China's weakness in core technologies, its continued dependence on American, and especially, uh, uh, especially in, in the semiconductor area, uh, was really laid bare uh, in the kerfuffle that we saw when Washington cut off exports of certain key semiconductors to the Chinese telecoms equipment manufacturer, ZTE. You'll recall this just from very recently. That company was brought to its knees. It had a near-death experience because of it. It very nearly folded until President Trump decided nobly to save the company. She never stops reminding people, by the way. We were as wrong, like I said, in our overestimation back then of, of China's capacity to, to uh, liberate the oppressed from authoritarianism's grip as we are now in our certainty that it's gonna create the society that George Orwell envisioned in 1984. I have come to believe that our extreme pendular swings when it comes to technology into China, our flip outs, our, our lack of, of measured perspective, these all issue from, from a kind of cognitive dissonance. China has this habit of, of, of challenging certain core American assumptions they become quite axiomatic, really, to the way that we think about the way the world works. First, as we're all familiar, it challenged this long-established and long-cherished notion that a free market economy was ultimately inseparable from political democracy. You weren't supposed to enjoy the fruits of free enterprise without commensurate political freedoms. One came with the other. And that, of course, meant multi-party democracy. The marketplace of ideas was supposed to be as indispensable to successful capital markets or, or labor markets or supermarkets as anything else. Uh, by the early 2000s, though, it was pretty clear that China had defied this, leaving many observers scratching their heads. Others were confident that political liberties were sure to follow a few years later. I'm not sure that's not true. They haven't, at least not yet. Um, I'm reminded of the words of a former uh, American diplomat, uh, one of the very uh, the, the wise men of American studies of, of China, Chaz W. Freeman, who I hope that your, your conference will one day come and invite the speaker. He's a marvelous man. Three times. So you know Chaz Freeman well. 
Uh, no, no, he is, he is uh, a marvelous mind. But he, he said, this reminds me of that theory that the bumblebee can't fly, of course, because, you know, the bumblebee is not supposed to be able to fly by the laws of physics, and yet the bumblebee flies. Uh, and if that weren't enough, China then now, I think this is the most important thing, has gone on to challenge another one of our core assumptions that, well, that I would describe as one of the, the, the sturdier bastions of American exceptionalism, and it, that is that idea you know, that it was in the Biden and Fiorina of thinking that, that we are uniquely innovative because we are a free and open society. So it wasn't enough, you know, for us to, to have been forced to, to confront uh, the cognitive dissonance of, of the simultaneity of, of free markets and, and uh, an authoritarian political system. But now, you know, we, we have to deal with technology innovation happening in an information repressed society, heavy handed censorship. As a bonus, just for one more, I mean, it also seemed to challenge the American faith that innovation was always sort of a bottom up thing, that it was always that scrappy entrepreneur in his garage is from, you know, the inspector the, Thomas Alva Edison and runs through Steve Jobs and beyond to the contemporary Silicon Valley. We uh, have always believed that innovation couldn't be a top-down phenomenon. That, of course, flew completely in the face of the real history of Silicon Valley, which was, of course, seeded very much by DOD money. But hey, whatever, but it's, it, it runs in the face of our mythology. I am not suggesting that we're wrong, though, to be concerned over Chinese capabilities in technology, because look, there is no doubt that Beijing will put some of these technologies to uses that are quite antithetical, not only to American interests, but also to our values as Americans. China will doubtless harness new technologies and data capabilities developed by its private sector companies to enhance its military capabilities. I'm, I'm, I hope to think, I like to think that I'm quite clear-eyed about this. Like it or not, and, and I don't like it, we have entered a time when Competition and not cooperation uh, are going to be sort of the way that uh, the bilateral relationship is, is framed going forward. Uh, people will be talking more about national security concerns uh, than about globalization, and that is not likely to change very soon. Believe me, I'm trying, though. I, w I worry, though, uh, that, that we are already pursuing policies that are intended to hobble or inhibit China, which perversely, will effectively marginalize American and other Western companies, it'll marginalize Western investors, it'll shut them out of the still quite massive growth potential uh, that is still to come across many fields of technology in China. Uh, we should remember, I think it's very good to remember, how extensively Western companies were involved, not just Western companies, but Western capital, was involved in the first great tech boom in China, the internet boom at the turn of the millennia. Uh, we should remember how despite the Chinese Communist Party, which has always been a party that demanded control of the commanding heights of any strategically vital sector, how nonetheless it somehow ceded control of this obviously commanding height kind of, you know, it's strategically vital sector, infra, in, internet and, and uh, you know, digital communications, it ceded control of the, the dominant companies to these companies where they were founded either by American returnees or heavily Americanized uh, Chinese individuals, founded with what? With Sand Hill Road money for the most part, with American venture capital, except in the case of Tencent, which got a lot of South African money. And where did they go? What capital markets did they go to when they wanted to, to list? They went to NASDAQ and the New York Stock Exchange. And somehow these companies were still allowed to absolutely dominate the Chinese internet sector. There's a period of, of incredibly good, healthy cross-pollination that lasted for quite some time. It was good for the development of the Chinese ecosystem. It was good for enterprise governance in China. You'll remember, of course, because they all had to be compliant with the quite onerous Sarbanes-Oxley requirements. And, uh, and this was very good for Chinese internet governance. It created space for sharing of best practices, for transfer of soft skills in both directions, for lots of intangible good that came of contact and of just proximity. In this time of mounting anxieties, all of us have come to, to 
And we know we have to come to a more realistic understanding, uh, a better assessment of China's intentions, of its capabilities, of its strengths, but also of its weaknesses. It's true um, for, for those of us who are looking to invest and make money in China. It's true for those of us who want to tap its markets or to c compete with its technologies. Or it's true for those of us who want to formulate policy to manage the competition that we're inevitably getting into, uh, how, how we're going to reckon with China's you know, and in, in technologically enhanced strategic capabilities is going to depend on us understanding what's happening in China. So to arrive at such an understanding, I think we need to do a couple of things. And I think that George really, in his talks and, and some of the others, we've already been helped along in that. So what I, I wanna focus on is not things like, under, I think Yashem yeah, had a really terrific uh, explanation just now, or I think it was Yunyan who, who talked about how, uh, how the, it was Yuan Yuan, in fact, Yuan Yuan, who talked about how the, the bureaucracy actually responds to the dictates from on high. When you look at a, a document like Made in China 2025, or you look at a document like the AI plan, I, I, a friend of mine named Matt Sheehan likened it to, uh, to a kind of mafia boss who gathers his, his, you know, his, his captains around him and says, hey, you know, I've got a point day coming up. You could surprise me and do something nice for me. You know, here's some things that I like. And then so, you know, they, they, they show, they, they, and then, you know, it becomes part of their KPI. If I'm running a, a county, I'm going to suddenly want to attract, do, find policies that are going to attract people who are doing fiber optic networks. I'm gonna to try to attract people who are doing advanced work in robotics or in gene editing technologies, or in gene sequencing, or anything like that. I mean, we, they're, they're, they're going to be graded on this stuff. And that, that's sort of how it works. So I'll, I'll skip over that, because I think that was covered very well already. But I want to focus instead on a very simple observation, because I, I really believe that technology innovation in China, as all, all places, it takes place within a quite particular sociocultural matrix, right? There are attitudes toward technology. There are beliefs about it. There's, there's sort of a posture that a society takes. Uh, and I've noticed just such a, a profound difference between how that is in the United States and how that is in China, just from my 20 years there and then my two and a half years or so back. I would start with this very simple observation that very few Chinese exhibit the same kind of unease over technology that is so prevalent right now in American society. Maybe it'll happen one day. That shouldn't be surprising. China, after all, since in the 40 years since the advent of reform and opening, have seen their ordinary lives just follow in lockstep as my device gets better, as my access to network, as my bandwidth gets faster, my life has improved. Everything about technology seems to improve the quality of my life. So why wouldn't they believe that? Uh, I mean, it, it's, you know, there's, there's anyone, I think, who has the lived experience of having lived through the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, the 2000s, and into this decade, has never seen a day when technology has sort of threatened that. But l look at our science fiction today. How many of you are familiar with this great show? It's on Netflix called Black Mirror. See it, it's, it's really great, but it's dystopian. In fact, I'm hard pressed to think of a single science fiction movie of recent years, except maybe Arrival, that isn't a, a, a sort of dark picture of the way that technology has warped and perverted our society in the Anglo-American world. Not so with China, not so with Chinese uh, science fiction. I, I would say, I mean, there's maybe a shorthand for this, that while the US, the UK, the rest of the West is in our black mirror dystopian phase, China is very much still in its Star Trek phase. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I, I mean, I think it's, it's telling that, that some of the most revered figures in the United States from the world of tech entrepreneurship or, or even from the physical sciences, uh, where you know engineering is ultimately grounded, have made statements that are quite alarmist. Uh, we have Elon Musk, of course, of SpaceX and Tesla, the man who wants to take us to Mars. Elon Musk constantly talking about summoning the demon AI, worrying about this. He's literally talking about armies of killer robots. 
I, I, my friend at Baidu, who was one of the world's prominent AI scientists, had a clever rejoinder. He said, well, Elon, I think that worrying about uh, armies of killer robots is a little bit like worrying about overpopulation on Mars right now. <laughs> we have yet, not yet set foot there, but yet you're, you're worrying about this. Uh, Bill Gates, another, another very, very you know, person who's always worried about the dark side of artificial intelligence. And even the late Stephen Hawking, who from his speak and say was, was intoning darkly and robotically about the future of, of uh, our mastery by these machines that we've created. There are some conversations along these lines happening in China. Uh, they are happening mostly in the bowels of the philosophy departments in the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. Papers that are read by six people do not see the light of day. Um, <laughs> There is nothing comparable, nothing remotely comparable to the popular discussion about AI in the West, the level of media attention that it gets. Uh, really, there's only one prominent speaker about this in China. Uh, his name is Kai-Fu Li. He's been quoted a few times already today. And he worries about one thing in particular. He worries about jobs. He worries about a, a world where work which now defines us. What do we say when we meet one another? Well, maybe not in a community where people are retired, but uh, <laughs> we're... But, but we say, you know, so what do you do? What do you do? I mean, we define ourselves so much by our work. And how is it going to be when we don't, when we're all, you know, on some sort of universal basic income and then we, we no longer need to work? And, you know, China remains a place where there is this an unembarrassed embrace of, of, of the idea of tech-driven bright futures. It's going to be a very good thing. I believe that it really lends to Chinese tech innovation a kind of buoyancy, a real lift, right? I mean, you can imagine how that is. I saw it day in and day out at Baidu, where I'd you know, get off the subway with all the mad press of people at the CRT station and see them all just disgorge from the subway and make their way to these enormous tech uh, headquarters of these big companies like Tencent and NetEase, and of course, where I work, Baidu. And they'd all be bright-eyed and bushy-tailed and ready to change the world. It was really an impressive thing. And I kept thinking, my god, this is what we're really up against. It's pretty amazing. Uh, but I've also come to the conclusion that China presents uh, sort of a, a political culture in which tech flourishes uh, for more basic political reasons, too. One is this. You know, Yuan talked a lot about bureaucracy. There's one feature of the Chinese bureaucracy that was quite deliberately engineered, was really brought into being beginning in the, the early 1980s by Deng Xiaoping. The composition of the Chinese Communist Party used to be predominantly people with working class and even farm backgrounds. He decided that that was not uh, the right composition of party leadership to take China through its four modernizations. So he set out to transform it and he transformed it in the image of one little island nation state on the southern end of the Malay Peninsula, Singapore. He went for the Singapore model of technocratization. So he set out to have 80% of the Central Committee be people with four-year degrees in the natural sciences and in engineering. So when I started studying the emergence of technocrats in post-Mao China uh, by the early 90s, there were two men, Li Cheng and Lin White at Princeton University, who had done really extensive work on the extent of technocratization that had already happened. This is the early 90s, and it only got worse, or better. <laughs> Depends. You know, it, it's really, China is the land of nerd empowerment. <laughs> it's true. China is a place where, you know, it is of, by, and for the engineer. You know, by that time, if you looked at provincial party secretaries, provincial governors, so both the party and the state functions, if you looked at municipal party secretaries, municipal governors, if you looked at mayors of, over, of cities of over a million people, you would find about 75% or more all had four-year degrees in the natural sciences or engineering. I would uh, not hesitate to have called it the most technocratic society on earth. And in such a society where the ladder of social and, and ultimately political advancement is through STEM, what do you think parents are going to encourage their children to study? So again, it's a, and there's a cultural element to this, and it's kind of wonderful. You know, 
the Xue Ba, the, the, the great student on, on the Chinese campus. Look, no, nobody is going to drive by him on the schoolyard with a Camaro and the jock rolls down the window and shouts, nerd, at him. It just doesn't happen. No, the Xue Ba, that guy, he's going to get the girls. He's the one who's going to, you know, be, do, he's going to rise through life. He's going to, uh, I think Hua Yasheng was one of those guys, right? <laughs> I mean, it's an amazing, it's an amazing place. I mean, I, I remember uh, reducing, after I dropped out of graduate school, my, my, uh, my dissertation topic to a 900-word column I was then writing for Time magazine, and I titled it The Revenge of the Nerds, and that's really, really what it was all about. You know, it's, it, it, so yeah, I think that there is this political component, and we would be wrong to over, overlook it. Um, I'll see where I am here, um, but you know, I think there's there's a, a, a worldview that comes with that that technocratic belief, and that worldview is one you know that that is pretty unsentimental. It's very pragmatic. It's mechanistic. It's very secular, and there's some bad things that come with that, but there are also some good things, you know. China does not waste a lot of time relitigating the Scopes monkey trial. And so <laughs> stem cell research, uh, even embryonic stem cell research, continues apace. Now, they've taken it too far. There was a, uh, a, a fellow by the name of He, he Jianqui, who was a uh, scientist trained in the United States, who we, we mentioned him earlier, who uh, really violated all sorts of ethical rules and, and edited, you used CRISPR-Cas9, a, a gene editing technology, to alter the actual gametes, uh, the actual you know, zygotes of, 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 of twin baby girls who were born, supposedly to confer on them immunity to AIDS, but who knows what's gonna happen. I'm very encouraged, though, because this was roundly condemned. Roundly condemned, not only by the Chinese scientific community, but by the government as well. The guy was basically in house arrest afterward, and he has really been quite ostracized. This may be one of those Tuskegee moments for, I think, for, for China, where people are, start, are, are, are going to start having those important discussions about ethics. But it's deeply troubling to me that, that the paths that the Chinese and the Americans are on, even while pursuing so many of the same technologies, are starting to diverge so badly. I worry that the administration's uh, open animosity, uh, which will surely beget reciprocal animosity, as well as unwise policies that we're now floating, things like these visa restrictions on Chinese students, is only gonna push Beijing to redouble efforts to go its own way. We have to find a way to compete in a healthy way that doesn't frame competition as merely zero sum. Uh, we have to find a way to recapture that fruitful cross-pollination of the last 40 years to leverage the often quite complementary natures of these two important tech ecosystems, and it's gonna become trickier. The Eurasia Group recently put out a really disturbing report looking at the possibility of a innovation winter as we try to decouple from our reliance on Chinese uh, supply chains. China's supply chains are remarkable. They're, and they cannot be easily reproduced. And if we want to reproduce all these, those factories and the warehouses, the assembly lines, the, the, the skilled labor force, and those complicated logistical chains, we want to reproduce that. Maybe we can, but it will take a lot of time and a lot of resources, and those resources will crowd out our ability to do R&D, will cost us our great advantage over China right now. It's a, it's a silly, silly idea. Blocking STEM students is a silly idea. What should we do instead? Look, one idea I've gravitated to is this notion of a small yard and a high fence. Because there are, in this, there are, there are technologies that we do want to try to milk for all it's worth before they're, you know, casually stolen by the Chinese. So we, we do, we, we want, we, but we want to uh, you know, limit them. There's just too many dual use technologies that we cannot build a, a, a large enough fence around. So small yard, who decides what's in the yard? That's a very difficult question. But once we do, we build a very, very high fence around it. That idea comes from my friend Sam Sachs, who's at the New America Foundation. She's a terrific thinker. Uh, and, and let's look, I wanna end up by saying, let's not be naive. 
I mean, China does, and it will continue to advance its interests, to push its own narrative, to try to exert influence beyond its borders. That is what states do. And really, you know, Americans are actually better at it than almost any, anyone else. Chinese efforts to do it are clumsy. They're ham-fisted. You can see them a mile away. They're completely ineffective. And I worry that we obsess over this, this idea of Chinese influence operations. Yeah, so, I mean, we, we really ought not, not to be doing that. Um, I have, though, I have great confidence in the ability of our professional diplomatic corps to tackle the very difficult, thorny issues between Chinese and, and us. I have confidence also in, in the natural immune system that we are blessed with as an open, plural society to deal with threats to the integrity of our civil fabric. Um, right now, I fear that these anxieties are giving way to a new red scare, to a new yellow peril, to a new McCarthyism a new Cold War that's marked by intolerance, by racial profiling, that will do much more to damage uh, that precious civic fabric than this perceived threat from Chinese technology or technologists ever, ever could. So thank you very much, and uh, I, I, thanks so much for having me. Thank you, Kaiser. Thanks a lot.